There's a little secret the oil industry has been trying to keep away from you, but we're going to try to expose it here today. This is a dangerous video. You'll see why. Let me tell you why. Because the oil and gas industry is a $7 trillion industry. There's so many people that have their hands in them making money. They're like, guys, we can't tell everybody that there's another way. The Finland just did something. They save power and energy for their consumers by 75%. We can't have the rest of the world to know about this. Because what if all of a sudden this goes from a $7 trillion industry to $1.8 trillion? We cannot do that. And that industry, the source they're worried about is nuclear energy, nuclear plant. So what they do is they hire lobbyists, $124 million in 2022, and nuclear only spent $1.56 million. So they've got a lot of powerful people protecting them. And they'll come out and say things like this, nuclear plant? What do you think about when you think about the world war nuclear? Explosion. World War III. Security. People dying. Radiation. This is horrible. This is why what happened to Fukushima and Chernobyl, this is why we have to protect the people. But then if you think about the oil industry, if it does get this disrupted, what region of the world would get plummeted? The Middle East, it's not as if it is already chaotic. Saudi Arabia relies on oil. You take that out, would the Middle East get even more chaotic? Would some of the powerful people in US that are in the oil industry get more chaotic? That's pretty scary. So they obviously have more leverage, but let me tell you what just happened in Finland. The newest nuclear reactor in Europe and the biggest by capacity started producing electricity in Finland earlier this year. Orki Luoto 3, which has completed test production and is now regularly producing electricity, is expected to account for 30% of Finland's power generation, the plant operator TVO says. After the startup of Orki Luoto 3, power prices in Finland, ready, saw a 75 percent plunge between December 2022 and April of 2023. It's expected to produce electricity for the next 60 years. You think the people in the oil industry want to know this? No. You know what we're going to do today? We're going to overcome all the objections they give us. Accidents, security, cost, sustainability, and then we're going to show you a wall they built, concrete wall at this nuclear plant, and they got this jet to fly into it. Explosion! To see how protected these places are and you'll be able to be the judge of that yourself. But having said that, we're gonna talk about this crazy topic of nuclear energy today. Okay, so if you give value out of this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let's get right into it. Nuclear is cheaper and cleaner. Take a look at the CO2 emissions avoided by the U.S. power industry. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, you would look at nuclear all the way to the left, cleanest, then it's wind, then it's hydropower, then it's solar, then it's geothermal. But if this is the case, why do we not get more plants and more people talking about building this? There's got to be a reason for this. Let's talk about it. So when you think about capacity factor, which is the electrical energy output over a given period of time, a plant with a capacity factor of 100% means it's producing power all the time. What plant do you think has the highest capacity factor? I'm assuming you took the guess and it's the right guess. Ready? Take a look at this. Nuclear, number one, 92.7%. Then it's geothermal. Then it's natural gas. Then it's other gas. Then it's other biomass. Then it's wood, coal, hydroelectric. Then it's wind, solar, solar, natural gas, internal combustion, natural gas, steam turbine. Then it's petroleum, which by the way is 13.2%. Guess which one we use the most in America? That one right there, petroleum. Then it's natural gas turbine, then it's pump storage, battery, then you can look at the other two. Take a look at this chart on the next page, what America uses the most. The number one most use of energy in America we use is petroleum, then natural gas, then renewable energy, which is solar and wind, then coal, then last place, nuclear, electric, power, only 8% of the time. Let's unpack to see how much money the government spends in regards to energy in fossil, renewable, and nuclear. When you look at fossil fuel, the government spends the most money on fossil fuel, which accounts for about 60% of its total energy spending. The majority of the spending goes to support the production and transportation of oil and gas. The key word there is what? Goes to support the production. The production. They're producing actual for transportation of oil and gas. Producing, not testing. Renewable energy, the U.S. government spends about 22% of its total spending on this. This money is used to support the development and deployment of renewable energy technologies such as solar, wind, and biomass, which again, we see a lot of that across the country. But look at nuclear energy. The U.S. government spends about 18% of its total energy on this. This money is used to support the construction and operation of nuclear plants. 
construction and operation of nuclear plants. We don't know how much of it is R&D, how much of it is actually doing the work. So when you unpack that, here's what you'll notice. The money allocated towards the nuclear energy is spent on the following ways. Number one, R&D, the U.S. Department of Energy funds research and development on new nuclear technologies such as smaller modular reactors and advanced nuclear fuel cycles, which is great. We need to constantly be doing R&D. Number two, licensing and regulation. The DOE and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's NRC are responsible for licensing and regulation nuclear power plants. This includes activities such as reviewing plan designs, conducting safety inspections, and issuing operating licenses. Again, find sometimes licenses they can be holding back and they delay giving it to, but we need to do that as well. Three, waste disposal. The DOE is responsible for managing the disposable high-level nuclear waste. This includes activities such as developing waste disposal technologies, conducting research on the waste disposal sites, and managing waste storage facilities. Again, we need that. And last but not least, security. The DOE and the Department of Homeland Security are responsible for the security at nuclear power plants. This includes activities such as conducting security assessments, providing security training, and responding to security threats. So now let's go a little bit deeper about nuclear power in the U.S. The U.S. is the world's largest producer of nuclear power, accounting for more than 30% of worldwide nuclear generation of electricity. The country's nuclear reactor produced 843 kilowatts per hour in 2019. That's about 19% of total electric output. So I want to show you these two charts in order for a reason, because something happened in 1986. Take a look at this. Nuclear energy production, the nation's leading non-fossil fuel energy since 1984, has remained flat for the two decades. Solar and wind energy are grown. So if you look at this to the right, you'll notice pink is nuclear. Look how it was skyrocketing, but it stayed flat for two. Then look at how solar and wind has gone up. Solar is green all the way to the right, and purple is wind all the way to the right. And then you'll see everything else is kind of flat. Nuclear was flat, but why did it slow down all of a sudden? This next chart I want you to look at, this one shows the operable nuclear power capacity. The more plants we build, the more power we have. And if you notice this chart, what question would you ask looking at this chart? Maybe the question is, why did it all of a sudden stop in 1986? Well, because in April of 26, 1986 is where the Chernobyl disaster happened in Ukrainian SSR. This is on the border of Belarusian SSR, again, in the Soviet Union. It is one of only two nuclear energy accidents rated at seven the maximum severity on the international nuclear event scale, the other being the 2011 Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan, the initial response and subsequent migration effort involved more than 500,000 personnel, cost an estimated 18 billion rubles, roughly $68 million in 2019 money, and this scared the hell out of everybody. And said, wait a minute, pump your brakes. This is pretty dangerous. We don't want to touch this. And then it's slowed down. Now watch this. In the U.S., when you look at nuclear plants, here's what you'll notice. We have 92 reactors, 53 plants, 28 states, roughly 475,000 well-paying, sustainable, direct and indirect jobs in the nuclear industry, 93% capacity factor in the U.S. for nuclear plants as of 2021. I can give you a bunch of different data that validates this is the direction we ought to go, but there are some concerns. Now watch. When did we build a lot of these plants? What are the dates? Here's what it shows. So this list shows the last 35 that have been built. If you notice, most of them were built in the 80s and the 90s. Clinton Power Station Units 1 and 2, 8991. Grand Gulf Nuclear Station, 89. Catawba Nuclear Station Units 1 and 2, 8991. Edwin I. Hatch Nuclear Plants Unit 1 and 2, 89 and 90. Perry Nuclear Power Plant, 87. And then again, you can go through all this. 85, 89, 83, 89, 82, 2014, 2016. Texas, 2016. Then there's one that's in the projects right now. Then there's a couple right now that's in the process in 2023. But you notice we've kind of slowed down after that because there was a major concern of what could possibly happen. Meanwhile, investment in two areas, wind and solar, has skyrocketed. Take a look at this chart here. From 2010, what do you notice? Look, look at solar installations in U.S. Look at the utility, blue. Yellow, non-residential. Blue, residential. Even if you go on this next chart here for wind investment in U.S. Go from 1986, Chernobyl happens. Look what happens all of a sudden. This drops a little bit. Then next thing you know, all we're doing is making investment. And then from 2010, it skyrockets all the way up to where it's at today. Wind technology. The U.S. Department of Energy has allocated $132 million in fiscal year 2023 funds for wind energy technologies. And by the way, you would think maybe the U.S. government is interested and wanted to find out a little bit more about this. We'll take a look at this in 2021 under Biden, $480 billion of stimulus spending was available for clean energy, of which only $8.8 billion went towards nuclear 
energy. Some of you may be watching and saying, Pat, I'm not trying to get into the nuclear business. Why are we doing this video? Do you want to get into the saving business? Because this could be applying to you. Your, your family may be interested in this. Your mom, your, your dad, your wife, your husband, people may be interested in this. Take a look at this. Household electricity prices worldwide in September of 2022. This is last year. Denmark is the highest. You think people in Denmark want that to be lower? How about Italy? How about Germany? How about Belgium? How about Lithuania? How about Netherlands? Finland just dropped because this is reported in September. They launched that in November. It dropped 75% two months after this report comes out. Then you got UK. So Finland was one of the most expensive. It's now one of the lowest, if not the lowest. Spain, Japan, Peru, Rwanda, France, and then it's US. US is one of the top 8% most expensive electricity in the world. Would we want to see that be slightly less. Now, the way I work is in business and sales is you choose all the top objections and then you figure out a way to overcome every single objection. We've done that. We got five objections for you. The arguments against nuclear energy. First one is nuclear waste. Second one is accidents. Third one is security. Fourth one is cost. And last one is sustainability. Let's start off with nuclear waste. Nuclear power plants produce radioactive waste, which can be dangerous to human health and the environment. The counter to that is used nuclear fuel rods are stored safely and securely at reactor and storage sites around the country, either in enclosed or steel lined concrete pools filled with water or in steel reinforced concrete containers. The US Nuclear Regulatory Commission has determined that it is technically feasible to continue to store used nuclear fuel safely at power plant sites or consolidated interim storage facilities for an indefinite period. Second objection. The accidents. Do we want another accident like this to happen? So nuclear power plants are susceptible to accidents which can have catastrophic consequences. The Chernobyl disaster in 1986, you know how many people died? 31. 31 too many, but it's 31. It's not 15,000, it's not 5,000, it's 31. The Fukushima in 2011, how many people you think died in 2011? One person. By the way, according to ourworldindata.org, only one death has been attributed to the disaster. This includes both the direct impact of the accident, because some people say, what about radiation? No, this is both the direct impact and the radiation exposure that followed. However, it's estimated that several thousands died indirectly from the stress and disruption of evacuation. Now, non-fatal injuries, you got six with cancer or leukemia, 37 with physical injuries, two workers taken to the hospital with radiation burns. Again, one is too many, but when you hear about this number, you think about it was so bad that so many tens of thousands of people died from it. They did not. However, let's counter it. In the US, nuclear power plants are constructed in such a way that they are essentially invulnerable to external assault, even by a hijacked aircraft. The reactor building is made of reinforced concrete and the reactor vessel holding the fuel is made of steel more than a foot thick. Furthermore, the fuel itself is encased in a solid metal alloy that is difficult to breach. All the equipment and the piping are ruggedly constructed and any equipment not located in the reactor building is housed in areas that are also strongly built. To give you an idea how tough the material is, Sandy National Laboratories in 1980 crashed an F-4 Phantom Jet into the same sort of reinforced concrete that is used to construct nuclear power plants. The result, the jet was destroyed into millions of pieces and the concrete was more or less fine. The worst scar was less than two and a half inches deep. And in 2002, the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, undertook an advanced computer modeling study to determine if nuclear power plants could withstand the impact of an aircraft crash similar to the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the Boeing 767 was selected as the crash aircraft in the study because it weighs more substantial than almost all commercial jet airliners flown in the U.S. The study concluded that none of the parts of the Boeing 767, including the engine, fuselage, wings, or even jet fuel could enter the containment building or any other sensitive areas like the used fuel storage pool. This means that in the ultimate catastrophic event, an airline crash or missile strike, a nuclear plant would not leak radiation. Next is security. What if all of a sudden somebody, you know, terrorists want to attack it and, you know, they target it based on from the top, they blow it up. Well, Here's a counter. Most U.S. nuclear power plants are surrounded by large rural areas, making it relatively simple to detect intruders. All of them are surrounded by outer perimeter fences equipped with sensors. The first stage of security is the owner-controlled area. Since the nation's nuclear plant went on high alert after 9-11, the security in these fenced external areas has been augmented by increased patrols and tighter access to the site. The second stage of security, which is protected area around plant buildings, is surrounded by double fences and access is strictly limited. The third stage, 
is vital area of containment building, which is heavily guarded and sealed off to all but those with specific access authorization. Nuclear power plant security plans have always been formulated to secure the facility against well-armed, violent, and possibly suicidal shooters. Worst case scenarios have planned for also include vehicle entering and delivering explosives. As events unfold around the world, security planners adjust accordingly. Employees are also scrutinized. Background investigators and personal evaluation systems are part of any nuclear power plant's safety and security planning. Plant personnel must be deemed fit for duty before they are allowed access to the protected area. Their psychological and physical conditions are constantly monitored and they are randomly tested for drug or alcohol use. Cost. This one's actually a very valid concern because it's not cheap. Nuclear power plants are very expensive to build, making them less cost competitive than solar and wind power. Counter, nuclear fuel, it's extremely dense. It's about 1 million times greater than that of other traditional energy sources. And because of this, the amount of used nuclear fuel is not as big as you might think. All of the used nuclear fuel produced by the U.S. nuclear energy industry over the last 60 years could fit on a football field at a depth of less than 10 yards. That waste can also be reprocessed and recycled, although the U.S. does not currently do this. However, some advanced reactors design being developed could operate on used fuel. And, and by the way, the oil people win in in this specific argument would cost because the average power plant, nuclear power plant, takes around four to nine billion to build, and the operating cost every year is roughly 150 to 200 million dollars. Great, now you have it. Now go make money. What are you going to do now? Who are you going to sell it to now? What kind of money are you going to make? If they can make the incentive for it that high, then it's a formidable industry to be a part of. If it's just savings, they still have to figure out a way to make money. So that's where oil wins to attract the capitalists that are willing to do this to make the money. That's why capitalism works, unless if government does it and asks you and I, the taxpayer, to pay for it and say, look, whether you like it or not, you gotta do it, then that's a different story. And last but not least, sustainability. Nuclear power is not a sustainable form of energy as the uranium used in nuclear fuel is a finite resource. Once uranium reserves are depleted, nuclear power will no longer be a viable option. That's what the argument is. The counter. A typical 1,000 megawatt nuclear facility in the U.S. needs a little more than one square mile to operate. NEI says wind farms require 360 times more land area to produce the same amount of electricity and solar photovoltaic plants require 75 times more space. To put it in perspective, you would need more than 3 million solar plants to produce the same amount of power as a typical commercial reactor or more than 430 wind turbines, capacity factor not included. So the U.S. Department of Energy made this uh, chart, which is actually pretty good. It says, how much power does a nuclear reactor produce? The equivalent of 3.125 million PV panels, solar panels, or 431 utility scale wind turbines, or 100 million LED bulbs, or roughly 1.3 million horses, or 2,000 Corvette Z06s. You want more perspective? Take a look at this one here. That one uranium pellet you're looking at, that looks like a female hand that that one lady is holding, an inch tall, is the same as 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, 120 gallons of oil, and a ton of coal. That's why people are talking about we may want to consider going to nuclear energy. So look, there's a couple thoughts of me when I'm thinking about this. One is my logical, one is my skeptical. This, the logical thought is, okay, they don't want to do this because of safety, security, cost. They're make, making some investment, but not yet. You know, maybe it's not that advanced yet. Chernobyl happened, they're scared. We don't want to be the next one that explodes and we're going to have to put up with this. No president wants a nuclear plant explosion under your watch. You're not going to get reelected and you're going to have to deal with this. So people maybe not doing it because of that reason, selfish reasons. They're afraid of what media is going to say. But let me give you the other side. So there's many people worldwide right now that are making money, young 20-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 16-year-old kids that reach out to influencers and they, they'll they say, let me make your short clips. And they'll message people and say, we'll make your short reels like Valuetainment style or such and such style or this person's style. And we're going to make you get millions of views. And people are like, oh my God, that's great. How do you do it? Well, we take a lot of time, but it's 25 bucks a reel. And you're like, okay, no problem. Go ahead. Here you go. And the next thing you know, there's an app on AI. You know what it does? You put a two-hour podcast, a three-hour podcast in it, this software independently spits out the top 10 most viral clips to go viral, put the captions, puts the face, does all the editing and the description on what to put in it. So you literally copy, paste, upload the video, boom, it goes out and AI already told you, this is the most likely video to go viral. Wait, what just happened there? All these other guys that are making, doing this app that they don't want anybody else to know and they're doing this for 20 other people, they're making 20, 30 grand a month. Do you think they want the talent 
to know that this technology exists. No, they don't want them to know that because you just cost them money. The same thing happens with these oil people, $7 trillion industry, where according to Forbes, every 10 out of 22 billionaire on the Forbes 400 list has ties to oil money. You think they're going to want that? No, they're not going to want that. But disruption happens in many industries. I've been on it where I've capitalized off of it. I've been on it where I took a hit from it in insurance industry and other things I've been a part of. It's coming. It's just a matter of when. But when you got lobbyists for oil spending $125 million in 2022, and you got only 1.56 million for nuclear energy, it's very, very hard to beat those other lobbyists who have much more money, much more power players with bigger congressmen contacts and senators and presidents on their speed dial to say, no, you can't do that. If you want money from me for your campaign, you cannot be supporting this. Oh, okay. No, no, we weren't going to do that. Do you see how that kind of works out? And by the way, what I'm talking to you right now, a lot of this is on the right side. Republicans are not going to be happy about this. We're like, what are you talking about? So what you should be talking about, but disruption is coming. And when disruption is coming, disruption doesn't care if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, if you're a white, black, Hispanic, Middle Eastern, Asian, college degree, no college degree, disruption has this much sympathy for you. Zero. It did it to newspapers. It did it to TVs. It did it to phones. It's doing it to computers. It's done it in many different industries. And it's not stopping today, even if you're a $7 trillion industry. Having said that, if you enjoyed this video, Give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you want to watch two other videos similar to this, there's one called Vertical Farm. And if you've never watched, I'm fascinated by this industry. Click here to watch it. And if you want to know, some may say the most powerful man in the oil industry, number one, most powerful man in the oil industry, MBS. If you don't know a lot about the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, MBS, click here to watch that. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.